am honored to talk in this uh, Ciclo de Conferencias at the Prado yet again. It's the fourth time I've done so since 2002. Few occasions have given me such pleasure in my academic life as these opportunities to speak in what I think of as the greatest museum for painting in the world. This, I always say to my students, this, the Prado, is where you must come if you want to understand the art of painting itself. That's what I'm going to talk about today. Before I go on, I just would like to congratulate the Prado and, of course, the Fundacion for its extraordinary donation that allowed the acquisition of this painting before you, of the Virgen de la Granada. It's an amazing picture and a worthy addition to this extraordinary collection of paintings that is here. It's, it's, you should be proud of yourselves for the work that the Fundacion is doing to enable the acquisition of the Alba Virgen. Um, I also would like you to pay attention to this picture as we move forward, because this, of course, you will see the similarities in type as we move forward between this picture and the one I'm going, one of the many that I will discuss to which Antonello was indebted. This, of course, is the beginning of the story. And this, of course, is the end. It's not working. Hmm. I'll do it here, okay. So that was the beginning, and this, as you know, is the end. So when Nuria de Miguel and Susana Maraval asked me whether I'd like to speak about Antonello da Messina's dead Christ supported by two angels of around 1476 or a bit later, or Roger van der Weyden's Roger van der Weyden's deposition of Christ of around 1434 to 38, so about 40 years earlier, I was in a quandary. <laughs> I love both these pictures. Roger's deposition was brought, by Philip II, was brought by Philip II to the Pardo in 1555 and has been admired as one of the great paintings in the world from the very day it was set up. Antonello's dead Christ was almost totally unknown until it was bought by the Prado, as Nuria just told you, in, for, in 1965. It was immediately recognized as a masterpiece. A few people tried to attribute it to other artists, to lesser followers of Antonello, but each attempt understandably failed. In his most recent catalog, Mauro Lucco dated the work between 1476 and 1479, when, after a long stay in Venice, he was already back in his native Messina at the very end of his life. These are two great paintings and two great works of art. They are also works that arouse devotion and compassion. But are these qualities, art and devotion via compassion, continuous with each other, or are they separate? That's the question. Do we separate art out from emotion or not? For, our, for over 40 years, I have been arguing about the importance of emotional responses for our understanding of works of art. My positions have often been dismissed. For much of this time, people have said that art has nothing to do with emotion. You will be surprised, but that's the sophisticated claim. They still say this. Following Kant's critique of judgment and works such as Collingwood's The Principles of Art, they say that art is a matter of pure form, that emotion is just some kind of trick to draw one into a picture. They say that in making an aesthetic judgment, one must leave aside whatever emotion one derives from a picture and not allow it to affect one's judgment of form or what makes a work a work of art. You see the point. They say the work of art, as opposed to just an ordinary image, has only to do with form and not to do with emotion as if you can separate the two. To say that we only see the work in a work of art when we judge a work independently of its emotional content, when we detach ourselves from the emotions it arouses. Only magicians, said Collingwood, rely on emotion to achieve their purposes. Real artists do not. 
To most people, this will seem an absurd position now. We all know how emotionally involved we can become in a work of art. For over 15 years, I've also written about the importance of empathy for the understanding of art, but once again, my claims have been dismissed. Intellectuals and academics also deny the role of empathy in our understanding of what constitutes art. But how can they claim these things in front of a painting like this? Today I want to show why they are wrong and why their analyses of this work fails to capture what makes it so effective both as a religious image and as a great work of art. I will also suggest some of the continuities and not the ruptures between the religious and the aesthetic dimensions of other works like it. Now, since I've spoken such a long time over the last, again, 10 years, or maybe even more, whoops. Uh, that's the wrong way around. I was upside down. <laughs> okay, thank you. Um, for over 15 years, I've also written about the understanding, uh, about, um, I've talked about, where are we? Yeah. Um, now we get it. Okay. <laughs> Since I've already spoken so much about Roger's deposition in the context of empathetic bodily responses to the expression of emotion and suffering, I decided to concentrate on the Antonello today. So I've talked enough about it, but I'm going to say something. So here, however, let's look at the Antonello. We'll switch between the two. Christ is seated on his tomb in a beautiful landscape. Blood streams from the gaping wound in his side. His head is thrown back in exhaustion. His eyes closed, his mouth half open. Despite his travail, it's a handsome head, more earthly than transcendent. Two crystalline tears fall from the angel's red-rimmed eyes, evidently swollen from weeping. Let's go back, you can see it better. You, um, you won't see the tears, but we'll see an enlargement later on, but you can see, I think, even at the back, how red-rimmed the eyes are. And this angel pulls back Christ's arm as if purposefully to display the wound, or perhaps, perhaps simply to stop the hand from being smudged or stained with blood. He pulls the hand back like this. There's a puncture in the flesh and the tendons of his left hand. That's the hand, of course, on the right. That's, um, but the stigma on the right palm should be there, just by the skull on the left of the picture, is barely visible. Blood also flows in thinner streams between the delicately painted strands of disordered hair. Again, from the back you won't see, but from the front you will. There's blood that streams from between the strands of hair on, uh, that comes from, of course, where the crown of thorns was forced upon his head. There can be no question of the emotional content of this picture, or that it was intended to be viewed with according emotions as well. And we almost feel as if our own heads were tilted back, as if we were inclining to the same actions both of Christ and the angel. In other words, I think when you look at this picture, you have a bodily sense of that upwardly thrown head and even of the angel pulling back as you just saw the arm from the wound. There can be no question of the art in this painting either. The modeling of the flesh, the subtle modulation of light and shadow passing across both flesh and muscles. You see that there. The expansive luminous landscape. The crisp folds of the cloth. That where is there? Down here. Crisp folds, we'll come back to that. The lovely colors, the way in which the salmon-colored armband. Where is this? I can't see the pointer. Oh. Anyway, the salmon-colored armband um, in, and the a red tinge in the wings of the angel serve as a kind of artful prelude to the deep red wound from which the blood gushes in Christ's side. All these are the work of a genius of painting. Do we need to be detached from emotions, as my opponents argue, in order to perceive how all this is done or to appreciate the ways in which emotion and suffering are so effectively conveyed? The art itself, they say, 
doesn't depend on our emotional involvement. It depends on the form and technique of the work, irrespective of the emotions involved in our viewing it, which in any case, they insist, vary from viewer to viewer and epoch to epoch. Now, this is an argument which I continue to have. My opponents say emotional responses vary from age to age, and I say, well, you would be surprised how similar emotional responses to pictures like this are, whatever your religion is. That's true. The, of course, they vary to some extent, but less than fashionably claimed. As if to emphasize this view of a divide between emotion and art, there's been a recent group of scholars who claim that there's a sharp division between what they call the age of the icon, when people responded to religious images as if God were in the icon and worshipped it on the basis of their religious and emotional feelings. So the argument is when you see this picture, you think Christ is present in the picture and you worship it because of your religious and emotional feelings. And then they say the division comes with the age of art when people were basically interested in the aesthetics of the image. This divide was marked by the Renaissance, they say, and documented by Giorgio Vasari, the first great historiographer of Renaissance artists, and amongst the harbingers of the turn from what they call iconicity to aesthetics. Amongst the first of these was, they say, Antonella. The best known theorist of this position is the German art historian Hans Belting and his views have had wide influence. I wish things were so simple. Today I want to suggest that there was no such decisive split and that medieval artists before Antonello were more attentive to aesthetic factors for the arousal of religious feelings than Belting allows, and Renaissance artists still attentive to the evocation of religious responses, even when using their ordinary skills, artistic skills, or their extraordinary artistic skills to evoke them. So my, the point that I'm trying to make is, in the Middle Ages, artists wanted to be religious, but they also were good at art. Later on in the Renaissance, they may have been overtly good at art, to put it crudely, but it was in the service of arousing the emotions. So what I want to suggest today is the necessity of emotion for the engagement of our attention in a picture like Antonello's, for drawing us into it and for enabling us to share in the emotions conveyed here. You don't have to be very, you don't have to know much about the religious context to see the emotional content of the scene or indeed to respond to it emotionally. A picture like this enables us to share in the emotions conveyed there, even before we begin to appreciate it as art, even before we begin to understand what makes it a great work of art, however instantaneous that awareness may seem to be. I'm going to suggest how pre-conscious forms of emotional engagement with an image precede and prepare our calibration of the artist's skill in producing both the work and generating the effects she, she wishes or he wishes to convey. So the point that I'm saying is you are drawn automatically into the picture by the signs of emotional response. You recognize those instantly before you have a sense of the skill required to produce it. I'll show how the perception of emotion and the ways in which it is expressed by a face or by the movements of the body arrest one's attention and drive, drive one's engagement with it. As my researchers in the field of neuroscience have demonstrated, the emotions of others and of depicted others are not only expressed by the movements of the face and the body, but they're also felt in the body of the viewer through the embodied simulation of those movements. That's why I was saying when you see the the picture of the head of Christ thrown back like that, you have a mild sense of a simulated movement within yourself. It's the, and this can be shown neuroscientifically, but that's not the subject of my talk this afternoon. It's the new artist's skill in understanding how best to convey to others the relevant emotions through the movements of the body appropriate to the evocation of such emotion that is critical. I will propose that works like Antonello's show that this is all facilitated by one's sense of felt closeness to what is shown within the image. Such feelings of closeness are enhanced by making the person one sees in a picture look somehow like oneself or like someone whom one knows. That's why one feels so involved. I wanted to begin with this great image in Palermo of the Virgin Annunciate, of the Virgin receiving the Annunciation from the angel, but then the lecture would have become too long. But one feels so involved in this picture, 
because one recognizes this woman as somehow like ourselves or someone whom we might know or would like to know. And this was painted, by the way, at the same date as the Antonello that's the subject of our talk. One's engagement with pictures is pre predicated on one's emotional engagement with them, even prior to one's awareness of the artistic effects that produce them. Only then, once we are unconsciously drawn in, do we become capable of judging the artist's skill. Let me return to Nuria's first option. You know it well. Ever since I began teaching early Netherlandish painting over 40 years ago, it has served as an emblematic and very well documented example of the relationship, at least for me, of the relationship between movement and emotion in a work of art. I've shown how 15th century understandings of the function and effect of works of art, whether religious or secular, are attributable to factors that depend precisely on the relationship between emotion and the body. What draws people into this work as we see every day in the Prado, is not just, you just have to look at visitors, it's not just the, un, not just the unquestionable brilliance of the artist's techniques, but the way in which he succeeds in conveying emotion through the expressions, the movements. That's, um, and the sufferings of the body and through the very tears that so vividly descend from their eyes across their cheeks. Sorry, at the back you may not see the tears, but they are there, translucent and crystalline. You don't need to know the biblical story at all to have a sense of the grief and compassion that lies at its core. You have a physical sense of emulating the very gestures that convey that grief. You have a sense of these gestures, wringing that, whoops, Magdalene, for example, on the right, wringing her hands. Where is that dot? Oh, here we are. Or pressing the cloth, about which I could also give another lecture, to your face to mop up the tears. You don't need to know the crucial texts. You just go along with the emotions that involve you and the visceral and interoceptive feelings that automatically absorb you. I've also spoken about how 15th century understandings of compassion, co-suffering, remember, sorry, co-suffering, compassion means co-suffering in the literal sense, not just sympathy, dovetails with present understandings of empathy, where both emotional and visceral bodily states are predicated on a feeling with in oneself of both the actual movements and the feelings of those bodies there. You understand both the grief on the virgin and the slump of the body that expresses it. Because after all, there's the slump of Christ and you understand, she's emulating Christ and you feel the slump within yourself. You understand at least something of the pain and the wound in Christ's side because of the arousal, so of the wind in the, in the hand up there and on the foot because of the arousal of your own secondary somatosensory cortex upon seeing it. We can show this by scanning and by uh, transcranial magnetic stimulation. See how the body responds, the body of the viewer responds to the sight of wounds like these. Many of these factors remain directly relevant for Antonello's picture as well, and it was indeed Netherlandish works like Rogers that inspired it. This art that is so accomplished in showing emotion in the eyes and via tears, expression at even the entire body, reveals Antonello's famous debt to the early Netherlandish masters, to his alleged training with Jan van Eyck, and his first-hand knowledge of the work of artists like Roger van der Weyden, who himself worked in Italy. We'll back to tears. All of you surely know that Vasari himself maintained that Antonello, so that's in 1555, maintained that Antonello studied with Jan van Eyck, the alleged inventor of oil painting, and is thus supposed to have brought the craft of oils to the Italian peninsula. Though it's now clear that the development of oil painting preceded both Jan van Eyck and Antonello, there can be no question that it was Antonello's mastery of this technique that enabled him to paint with such such extraordinary precision. Not only the enamel-like depth of the colors, but the fine, crisp folds, 
that's what I was talking about earlier, only conceivable in the light of a knowledge of Netherlandish painting, the shimmer of the angel's hair, each individual lock so finely grained, painted, and the amazing detail and fineness of Christ's hair, interspersed with drops of blood from the crown of thorns that rested on his holy head. So all this is unimaginable without early Netherlandish painting, including the landscape. Oops, lost the landscape. Go back to the landscape. It's clearly recalling the walls and the Duomo of Messina, the aerial perspective that carries our eyes into the luminous distance, the blue water off to the left. You should be able to see it. Oh, off to the right. Where's the blue water? Sorry, no. There. <laughs> see, the eye goes right out there. And the high and the finest of the trees and the high and rocky walls from which more vegetation grows. Up, oops. Those rocky walls. This comes straight out of Jan van Eyck. That detail to geology. Remember, too, what Michelangelo is supposed to have said of Flemish painters. Michelangelo said, according to Francisco de Hollanda, that they were skilled at showing landscape and emotions just as here, which, Michelangelo disdainfully continued, chiefly pleased women and nuns. That's what he said. The, these paintings are good for women and for nuns. Be that as it may, let us note that this angel is no transcendent, inaccessible being. It's a boy, a boy whom we could easily know, so much so that we almost seem to suffer with that too young sufferer who is so akin to ourselves and even, or to our children, and even more poignantly to them. It's the kinship that makes our empathy all the more trenchant, although it's the expression and the very movements of the face that arouse our empathy in the first instance. So I want to go through, if you'll allow me, I'm going to try to abbreviate what I have to say because I have so much more to say, but we'll see what we can do. So I want to now go and look at a series of crucifixions by Antonello. The first one is the earliest. Uh, well, you, I hope you can see from the back. It's much simpler. Um, it's a small picture, uh, probably dated... Um, to the 50s, so 20 years before the picture here in the Prado. It's been compared to Jan van Eyck's crucifixion in the Metropolitan Museum. So you can see van Eyck here on the right and Antonello there on the left, where the rather elongated figures beneath the cross and the high crosses themselves are indeed similar. So you see the Flemish influence here with the landscape spreading upwards to the high horizon, all very Flemish. The tall crosses, um, similar. Grief expressed, well, you won't be able to see it entirely, but they express their grief. Let's see if I can... Here, you see, clutching the hands together like this. I don't know whether you can see it, but you also see her wiping the eyes, one of the Virgin. So all of these motifs recur throughout Netherlandish painting. Um, but of course, they also occur. Gestures of wiping the hands or doing this also occur in the, in the Arena Chapel, for example, by Giotto. We see all this again. Now I'll show you some details in the next one in the series. Great painting in London. Um, once more, you see the aerial perspective, that lightening of the sky towards the horizon that carries your eye into the distance. Um, all this is certainly Flemish again. The extraordinary detail of the skulls. See the skulls here at the base of the cross. All this fine painting is definitely due to what he learned from Flemish paintings which he had seen in Italy. But remember, these skulls are there because Golgotha means in Aramaic place of skulls. But what is most striking in this painting, what instantly engages one's attention and absorbs one in the mood of the picture are of course the figures of the Virgin and John the Evangelist themselves. They are like children, it seems, altogether lost in their sadness, desperation, and grief. We feel for them immediately because they are so accessible in their need for both our compassion and our protection. She is no, as she would be, majestic queen of heaven. She's a virgin of humility, not standing beside the cross as in most other earlier paintings, but seated directly on the ground, 
humility and simple childish sadness go together. It's impossible not to be involved either with her or the poor John the Evangelist. His arms stretched out in hopelessness, his eyes swollen and red with crying. Took the artist just a slight tint of red paint, if you see this picture, in the eyes to show that. To have access to the core of the story, the artist realizes, one needs emotion. One needs to evoke the compassion of the viewer through her empathetic or through the viewer's empathetic understanding of what is happening inwardly to the mother of Christ. And this is enhanced by the compassionate downward gaze of Christ. Look at Christ above. Let's see if we can get it. See, Christ is looking downward at them compassionately. He's not given up on his own suffering. He's feeling sorry for his mother. This child, she, it's as if he had become the father, not the son, the compassionate father of this childlike mother, as if he, even in his suffering, has pity on her sorrow for him. These multiple forms of compassion, of compassion via suffering, as we shall see, all occur richly and repeatedly in the popular literature of the time which we'll come to and so do its constituent elements of humility, emotion suffering and co-suffering passio as they say in Latin and compassio but wait, you may also have noticed once you detached yourselves from the feelings for the protagonists of the scene that there's a label here with Antonello's name which actually was cut out of the back of the picture and put on the front, he himself painted it and that probably, the, it's a, as you also notice, that probably the work was cut at the top. You see, it wasn't completed. Where is my dot? Here. And there may be two. Perhaps it was cut altogether at the sides, excluding the thieves. Look, so your artist is there. His name is right in the middle of the picture. But we lost the thieves, but there they are in the third version. Of the picture of the crucifixion. Now in Antwerp, this is the same time as Antonello's painting. Same time, same Flemish influence. The landscape, the aerial perspective, the roads winding into the distance, and so on. The virgin, no longer a child, but still a virgin of humility. She's seated on the ground. If you could see her face, she's not a child any longer. John the Baptist has his hands clasped in prayer. In prayer. And let me remind you, he's still sort of on the ground there, that in contemporary treatises on praying, like the very popular Giardino de Orazione, insist, Giardin de Oracion, insist that prayer always be accompanied by humility. So you see how this virgin, the crisp folds again of her dress, that's from Flemish painting. There, John the Baptist, similarly. But here, too, the stump with Antonello's name. There, there's a stump with his name put on. Shows you the artist is right in the picture. And so he's aware of his art. It's not just a religious picture. And notice also the ways in which these extraordinary curving feet of the, uh, of the uh, uh, good and the bad thief. They've actually been hacked at the shins. But at the same time, these bodies, especially the one on the right, are balletic in their suspension. Where does this come from? He's obviously seen the very latest in Florentine art. This is Polaiuolo's two years earlier, Polaiuolo's bronze statuette, it's taken from both sides, which must have been known to Antonello. He is in competition with the latest artists of his time. This is uh, uh, um, uh, Polaiuolo's Hercules and Antaeus. This is certainly self-conscious art. There's no question that a work such as Antonello's would have appealed very precisely to collectors sensitive to such competitive emulation, such signals of what was then most modern. But still it was the emotional di dimension, as you've seen, that provided the occasion and spurred on the art. <coughs> 
The point was first the involvement of the spectator, then the recognition of the art involved in creating such involvement. For the age of the icon continued into the age of art. Such forms of arousal and continuity were overlooked by Belting, who, ironically, was actually one of the most sensitive to such features, given his expertise in Byzantine and early medieval art and the many texts that underlie them. To suggest that a work like Antonello's represents a whole new paradigm, let alone a new age of art, is to overlook what draws the viewer into the work in the first place. It's only once emotion about these religious figures has grasped one's attention, as we know from many studies that they do, that one becomes aware of the art in the picture. This is the ever-present factor in all religious imagery and arguably all works of art. You have to be drawn into the picture, absorbed into it unconsciously, and then you have a sense of what goes into it. So let's return to the great dead Christ mourned by an angel. As we'll see shortly, it's actually very closely related to a tradition that hovers on the borderline between an image produced for devotion and an image produced as a work of art. In fact, um, it's a borderline that is both a modern invention and also an invention of the kinds of censors and critics like Giglio da Fabriano, who criticized Michelangelo for concentrating on style and art at the expense of religion and spirituality. But, as I'm trying to show, there is a continuum between these two categories, not a division. And that continu continuum started well before the Renaissance and continued long after. So the immediate predecessor of Antonello's work, as has often been noted, and I think it's even on the label inside, are, of course, Venetian. Now I go into some details. Both Jacopo and Giovanni Bellini, and, as has not been noted, Antonio Veneziano and Carlo Crivelli. That he was competing with them, or for that matter, they with him, all in this decade of the 70s is clear. But what has not been sufficiently emphasized is the iconographic originality of the work, the originality of the way the subject is presented. People all say this comes from Bellini, but Antonella was his own man. As is often been noted, the position of Christ's head, thrown back and open-mouthed, is very close to that in Bellini's Pesaro altarpiece. See? Head thrown back like that. It's usually said that Antonello's painting is somehow derived from Bellini, but who is to say? In any case, whether it's before or after Bellini, the competition between them was obviously swift and intense. They're actually very different kinds of paintings, as you can see. Antonello's vastly more emotional. The same in a way, you see, it's Bellini, but does it have all that emotion? No, Antonello is much better at this. Here they seem all routine and mechanical in comparison. The wound, for example, is just a little tiny scratch there. Nothing like Antonello. So, you know, you ask yourself, these art historians are saying, well, it's all derived from Bellini. Well, it is, but look how different they are, and they're different because of the emotional function of Antonello. And this angel is pulling back the arm, but not so decisively. So if we look at what's probably a later picture in Berlin, same. Actually, he has all three stigmata showing the connection with St. Francis, you remember, St. Francis sees all three stigmata of Christ, side, each hand. So the only picture in Bellini which has this emotional intensity for the moment is this painting, but that's the head down, in uh, Zanipolo in Venice of 1465. But here, there's no effort to pull away the arm to show the wound. Really, they're wanting to show the stigmata in the right hand of Christ. So all this shows how Bellini fell short of Antonello's intensity. You'll have noticed that in all these paintings, there are two angels. And remember how common this two angel behind the Christ is, as indeed the two angels behind the Christ in the Alva Virgen de la Granada. It's a very typical type the central holy figure of the virginal Christ, two angels behind. In fact, the only example I've been able to find with only one angel is the late, oops, 
is this later picture in the Johnson collection. Um, attributed to Giorgione, and it probably reflects Antonello's work, but of course it's much less intense, altogether different painting, a more adult um, angel, none of this closeness to the types that we see. So let's go back to further aspects of the iconographic originality of the work. No comparison. So we can trace this back to what is called the Imago Pietatis, the image of piety. And Panofsky, in a famous article, identified such images as Andachtsbilder, images which command one's attention in order to arouse one's devotion. You see this, and it's supposed to arouse your devotion. One was supposed to meditate on these pictures, concentrate on them. You see the close focus. You concentrate on it, and you're supposed to identify with Christ. This is the archetypal example, early 13th century in Santa Croce in Jerusalem in Rome. But here's a Bellinian copy of that type, another one. But the real predecessors, again this is Antonello and the North, not just. The real predecessor in emotional terms are these paintings. This by Meister Franca of around 1420. Looks as if it only has one angel, but notice these two angels, that one there and that one there at the bottom. And actually, you see how original it is? The usual type of these Andachtsbilder or these Imago Pietatis, Imagines Pietatis, is they show just the hand like this indicating the wound not this dramatic pulling back of the hand from the wound. You're supposed to see the wound, that's clear. But you see how original um, these antecedents of Antonello are, even though he clearly learned from that. Or, even more so, two angels, Christ, 1440, Petrus Christus. So this form with the two angels is, of course, the one that Bellini himself would use as well. But Antonello is much more emotionally explicit than any of these. So these are the usual antecedents that are cited in painting for Antonello. Not usual, but sometimes they cite it. I'm not very original in doing this. However, for emotional drama, we need to turn to the sculptors. Already in the early 14th century, don't know whether you can see, there's a really suffering Christ from the pulpit in Pisa by Giovanni Pisano. And above all, we have the wonderful panel by Donatello in Padova, um, the panel from the altar of St. Anthony. Here at last, and not unexpectedly in Donatello, the most emotional of 15th century sculptures, we have the f kind of emotional pitch that we find in Antonello. They are angels who, if they had red eyes to disgorge their tears of the wounds of the suffering Christ, they would certainly do that. The only Bellini we need recall here is the earlier example in the Museo Correr, which may have inspired Antonello's open mouth Christ, as well as the important, much smaller painting that inspired it. So that's the interesting Antonello, also in the Museo Correr, inspired by Bellini. Unfortunately, the faces were abraded. We don't know what happened to those faces. You can see that it's perfectly painted, the same crisp folds, but those angels, it's not incomplete. They seem to have been abraded, a great loss. Such emotion really only appears in Bellini in the paintings of Christ as Man of Sorrows with Angels, not only in the paintings of Christ as Man of Sorrows with Angels, but with the Virgin and John the Baptist and occasionally the Magdalene. So what I'm going to show you now is a series of paintings where the Italian painters before Antonello reached the same emotional pitch as, or similar emotional pitch, but they were with the mother mourning the son. So this is Giovanni da Milano, beginning of the 14th century. But then we do find this type famously in the Prado. So here, suffering, that open mouth, is absolutely clear. You find it here, 
the Palazzo Ducale. Also, he learned this from Donatello, as we shall see. Don't know whether you can see. In these drawings already in the Jacopo Bellini sketchbooks in the Louvre. These are amazingly emotional pictures, intense. I'm going to say something about the fact that they set in a landscape in a moment. I just show you this, a prayer book, which I'll come to later on. See, you have the same emotional intensity when the Virgin, as we have seen already. But this is from Donatello and also in Bellini, the open-mouthed expression of the protagonist. Mouths wide open. Similar, this is Antonio Veneziano. And then these remarkable examples, clearly appealing to emotion in, with the angels, two angels though, in states of great grief. So this intense mutual emulation in these circles. But we've moved, at least in the belting model, across several genres. When we look at the earlier Men of Sorrows, as we have supported by angels, just as with this Antonio Vivarini's Pralia Altar in the Brera, we can be fairly sure that these are panels intended for devotion. Clearly, you must pray to these. When we look at Crivelli, we are less sure. You see that? But it's gold back, so you know you can say, well, it's art. This is late for a gold back, as we used to call it. Indeed, the painting in Philadelphia seems close to the formal motifs of Antonello here in the Prado, especially in the open-mouthed head of Christ tilted back. We've seen that before. But then again, one wonders whether a work such as this was not inspired by Antonello, more or less the same time, rather than the other way around. That may have been the case. The backgrounds in all these pictures are gold, but the work seems to, con the work seem to contain much else that seems made for the art admirer and collector. For example, in the Paul di Pezzoli, oh, I should have shown you those details. See, what is that fruit doing up there? and the amazingly foreshortened foot there. It's a kind of paragone for the painter. But here, as always in the earlier paintings by Crivelli, everything seems too overwrought, too overdone to be convincing. Antonello clearly understood how to represent convincing emotion better than this man, and he probably also inspired him, as I suggested. The earlier Men of Sorrows are clearly Andachtsbilder, Imagines Pietatis, paintings intended for focus and devotion. The last ones by Bellini, just to remind you of them, set in these amazing landscapes. It's almost, so they show the agony in front of a nice landscape. It almost, Bel Belting would say, it almost seems as if the devotional form or the devotional iconic form has become entirely aesthetic. I think this is the claim he and his followers Alex Nagel and Chris Wood would make. The landscapes, they claim, make them a form of narrative. So too, they say, the emotion in these faces itself seems too easily, recogni too easily recognizable. So the counterclaim by Belting and Nagel and Chris Wood is that they are this worldly, these figures, not otherworldly, present in this landscape, terrestrial, not transcendental. But what all these writers forget is that the transcendental is present in the everyday too. For Belting, the signs of naturalism, whether in the Virgin in Messina as a possible portrait or in these pictures, oops, oh yeah, okay. Within their naturalistic landscapes and their narrative expansiveness. So, what I'm saying is let's just look at the landscapes. You have this naturalistic mother there, the landscape, and then the naturalistic landscape again. These authors say that their narrative expansiveness in the landscapes closed the door to transcendence in the icon and instead mirrored real space in front of the painting. They say it marks a significant break with the past and a corresponding dawn of modernity. I just don't see this. I don't see 
Antonello's painting as so different from the paintings that preceded him. He was certainly a better artist, but they call on emotion as they always had. There's no room, they don't realize that there is continuity in visual response and modes of behavior around devotional images across this hypothetical divide. For me, this continuity is critical. There's no turning point to a new age of aesthetics. It's not an opposition, as they and others claim, between art and cult. Artists had always sought the psychological engagement of the beholder, especially in the case of these Andachtsbilder and countless Imagines Pietatis. I mean, they had always done this at about the same time in Holland. Oops, I've lost the picture. Never mind. In Holland, they do a very similar thing <laughs> with um, uh, artists where the emotion and the blood is just as strong. So the boundary between the old and the new paradigms is simply too fluid to suggest that there's a distinction between the new types of paintings and the old types of paintings, one concentrating on emotion, the other concentrating on art. The fact is, as I've said, you need figures to have, you need to have figures you recognize as similar to yourself in order to empathize with them and with their suffering, as indeed with Christ's, because their bodies are our bodies and because Christ was born a man. So you can't just say that images which uses naturalistic affective techniques to invoke an unfolding human story set in the world was intended as to function, can't have intended primarily to function as the catalyst of transcendental, atemporal, and otherworldly experience. They forget that this worldly experience, if these people look like ourselves, if this landscape is like a landscape, we know this is intended to take you up to the level of the spirit and the level of Christ and Christian belief. Anybody could see that even without being believers. And you need this because you are drawn in, you need to be drawn into the picture. The sense is not a fiction, but of reality. You don't see it as fiction. You see this as reality, and that's why you respond to it immediately. What's critical to all the paintings we've looked at today is what I've called the necessity of emotion. In order to achieve the engagement that emotion brings, the artist, whether in the Renaissance or earlier, needs to mobilize his full skills in drawing the viewer into the religious moment, the moment that depends on us empathizing with Christ and those who suffered with him. And it's precisely this, as Belting and his followers forget, that actually motivates the art, motivates and inspires the art. We learn this with great clarity from the two texts which I've alluded to earlier. The continuity between the texts I'm going to talk about right now, despite the differences in their, orig in their original context, is clear. The first text is the Meditations on the Life of Christ, once attributed to St. Bonaventure, it's typical of art historians, then to the pseudo Bonaventure, but in fact it originates in a late 13th century Franciscan context of precisely the kind we know Antonello often worked for. The second is by none other than the radical Florentine monk Girolamo Savonarola. The meditations, the early Franciscan treatise, the meditations circulated in hundreds of copies that influenced pictorial art. While Savonarola's texts of 1492, though less widely circulated, aroused the most passionate of followers. But, those of you who know a bit of the history of Savonarola, what, you might say, has Savonarola, the fervid Dominican monk, to do with Antonello? who was so close to the modest Franciscans. We all know the Dominicans are crazy, the like Dom Dominicanes, remember, with, from the Franciscans. The fact is that a number of his treatises, particularly a set of them written in the second half of 1492, show extraordinary similarities with the earlier meditations, especially in their visualization of the life of Christ and also in their significance for the understanding of paintings and their recommendation of the evocation of the emotions in the devotional life and the use of visualization in doing so. So both of these texts contain frequent exhortations of the kind regularly, let's see if we go back to that, 
Both of these texts contain frequent exhortations of the kind regularly transmitted by preachers to non-literate as well as to literate audiences to transform the act of looking into corporeal feeling in order to better understand Christ's suffering. When he speaks of the crucifixion, for example, they say, look at him well then as he goes along, bow down by the cross. Feel as much compassion for him as you can, placed in such anguish. Feel as much compassion for him as you can, placed in such anguish. It emphasizes the conjunction between looking and feeling as how one is supposed to imagine the scene visually. And remember that crucifixion that I showed you. As he hung on the cross, this is what the meditations say I'm citing. As he hung on the cross, Christ himself said, My father, to God he's saying, See how afflicted my mother is. I ought to be crucified. Not she, but she is with me on the cross. She does not deserve the same. And she was grieved and looking at the wounds of her son was weakened by the sorrow of death. Do you see how often she is near death today? The link between looking and feeling, well, I should have showed you that picture, but what the point I'm trying to make is the, the relationship between looking and feeling. Link, look between looking and feeling, between sight and actual physical sensation could not be clearer. One must look and feel with a body as if to feel in our body what he feels in his. And when I say feel, I mean in both senses, both physical and psychological. It's worth recalling that one of our commonest synonyms for empathy is compassion. Compassion from the Latin for co-suffering. And that in the 14th and 15th century, the passage from actual bodily suffering to emotional co-suffering was a frequent and insistent topos. Viewers were asked to imagine scenes that were clearly predicated on actual paintings and then to feel Christ's wounds as if they were in one's own side and in one's own hands and feet. One had to visualize, recall, and feel the bloodied forehead pricked by the crown of thorns. There you see that forehead pricked by the crown of thorns. His deeply pierced side and the wounds in his hands and feet. So this is the parallel that is never far away with St. Francis. It was this that aroused both pity and piety, imitation and compassion, and this that underlay pictures such as the Prados, where the angel pulls away Christ's shroud just to display the wound. Oh my soul, what are you doing? No, don't want that quite yet. <laughs> what are you doing, says the devotee in the final chapter of Savonarola's first text of 17 May 1492, the treatise on the love of Jesus, followed a month later by the treatise on humility, which was illustrated with this one woodcut that represents the very type that stands at the origins, the two angels, the Christ, of those paintings by Bellini and Antonello. You remember that when I began, I said that I love this painting. And in saying that, I expressed the very emotion of desire that was supposed to accompany its viewing and that surely motivated its artists. Open your eyes, I quote Savonarola now, and look at the scene that you see before me. Respond to me, O soul, respond. What are you thinking? What are you looking at? I can only cry. That's what the, the treatise says you must say to yourself. When I look at this image, I can only cry. I can't think. I haven't the strength to speak. Oh, eyes cry and shed tears. Bathe my face. So you see, this is what we are seeing in the face of the angel. Contemplate then, my soul, how great his suffering was. And so it goes on. Above all grief, he says, it was their tears, their signs that afflicted him, and most of all, the collapse of his sweet mother. All Savonarola. It's precisely texts like these that show the necessity of the forms of emotion that go in hand in hand with the desire to look at these pictures. Here's another text that introduces the last pictures I want to talk about today. And when he stood at the column, he had a sharp suffering in his external senses, and especially in the sense of touch, as he was struck with so many blows and wounded by the sharp crown of thorns again. And he goes on about how Christ was such delicate complexion that he felt these wounds even more deeply. He was suffered, 
Now listen to this. He suffered in his other senses, but above all by the tears and sighs of his sighs of his mother. How, O oh soul, can you see your beloved exposed to so many torments because of love of you? You see him turned down and hit with blows. Why do you not bathe your own face with tears? This all sounds very fervid, but this is the context, the background for these pictures. It's insisting on the suffering of the mother. Savonarola knew and Antonello knew in all their art how to show the passage from body to mind, from viscera to mental feeling. One minute it's the virgin grieving for her son, at the next it's Jesus being afflicted at the sight of his own grieving mother, and the next it's we the spectators who thus afflicted at the sight of both son and mother in their grief for each other, at the sight of the tears on Jesus' face, and then his mother's and the angels grieve along with him. Look at the son, look at the mother. You see, this is the constant emphasis on visualization and consider whether you ever saw such a cruel spectacle. This is how Savonarola wound his viewers up to a high emotional pitch. It's an imploration to be empathetic with Christ, with the grieving body of Christ and the empathy that Christ feels for his grieving mother. It's an empathy that's in our own case heightened by the very looking that these pictures command. It's fraught, the whole treatise of Savonarola is fraught with mutual compassion. Christ, his mother, and the spectators. His mother weeps for him and he weeps as he sees his mother weeping. And finally the viewer pleads to be allowed to participate in both her and his suffering. To be allowed to share in the laments, in the tears, the abundance of tears. It's very high pitch of emotion. When we put together these texts by Savonarola with the last series of works I want to show you today, we find that the paintings are perfectly clarified where they might quite mistakenly have been regarded as vague or ambiguous. You remember that I traced the early origins of Antonello's painting to the early type of the Man of Sorrows, those pictures in Santa Croce in Jerusalem and then the Flemish paintings. But look at this painting by Antonello in the Metropolitan Museum. That's the first in the series of paintings that I want to show you now and I want to close with. Look at his expression. Is this suffering or is this compassion? Almost all of Anton Antonello's single pictures of this type derive from these works. See there? It's at the column, the noose around his neck. And yet, these are supposed to be devotional votive images, but there's something intimate about them, something that makes the suffering of Christ all the more personal, all the more capable of arousing compassionate feelings, not only because these are familiar figures, because here he looks like someone we could conceivably know. Look at this type. But, as we learn both from the meditations and the treatise on the love of Christ, because we love and cry, Christ and pray to him because of his suffering and because of the compassionate suffering that allowed beholders to feel even more closely than he felt to expand their devotion sentiments to the, large, to the largest capacity. That is why we empathize with him. We see Christ here, we feel pity for him and we are aroused to ever more intense devotion. But there's something more about all these pictures. They show a Christ, as I've just said, who is not just suffering, but someone who himself feels compassion, who looks, as it were, as if he himself were looking empathetically onto someone else. See, he's sympathizing with someone else. For of course he's doing just that, just as the Savonarola text makes very plain. These are pictures in which Christ is not so much suffering because of his own wounds, but because of his pity and compassion for those like his mother who are suffering for him. So when we look at these pictures, we realize he's not presented as suffering from extreme physical torment. He's showing understanding and empathy for the others who feel for him. He isn't shown as tortured by his wounds or beatings. He is aware of the pain he has caused in others. And so the series, for all its art, 
continues through those works which ever more emphasize Christ's physical suffering as a result of the ways he was treated by others or the ways in which he was persecuted for you and for me, the external ones exemplified by the noose, the external sufferings exemplified by the noose that's going to be tightened and the crown of thorns which we've seen, the internal ones by the expressions we have now just clarified. Empathy, not suffering. Suffering in empathy. The culminating point of this entire series, the one in which Antonello brings together all his artistic skills in the representation of suffering, as well as his technical skills in painting, is the one in which perhaps he comes closest to the very portraiture in which he also excelled, the subject of another lecture. And it's the head, this head precisely, that he immediately turned, morphed, we would now say, into the head of Christ in the Prado. See, took that, and it became that. The power of this picture lies in the vivid power of a portrait of a distinctive head, of the strong yet desperate imploration of God, and the magnificent painting of the tears of this man in the prime of vigorous life. I think I have one detail. The purely devotional picture. Remember how all those treatises is look and cry. The purely devotional picture, whether portrait or not, because in fact it is a portrait, whether art or not, but it certainly is art, turns quite precisely, except for the final closing of the eyes, into the painting in the Prado. Were these pictures then bought because they rouse devotion or because of their art? Do they show real people or not? We don't always know. But that's not the point of these paintings. Even in the end, if we decide that painters merely use devotional subjects such as these to show off their artistic skills, the point is the necessity of emotion. Only then can beholders detach themselves, become aware that they are not the person in the picture. So I should say, the emotion is what the hook that draws people into their involvement, their immersion and their absorption into the picture. Only then can the beholders detach themselves, become aware that they are not the person in the picture or one of the tormentors who have caused the trouble and pain in the picture, but rather that they are themselves. Only then can they see these images as representations and these great works of painting as art. There can be no question of art in these works by Antonello. Indeed, they are not just harbingers, but full-brown representatives of the priorities of Renaissance art. But we are still in the age of the icon. What drives them in the first place is religion, not art. What informs them is the necessity of emotion, the emotion that allows the viewer to engage with these images in such a way that they not only may or may not serve spiritual purposes, but actually provide access to the art within them. There's no rupture between the alleged age of art and the age of the icon. There's direct continuity, as we see here, and that continuity is what makes one realize the need to attend to the necessity of emotion and attend to these more or less religious works, these residues of the worship, devotion, and empathy that actually stand for our engagement with all images. For in images such as the ones I've been showing you today, we learn the profound lessons of how aesthetic judgment is always preceded by that which draws us into the picture in the first place. In other words, what draws our attention to it is always the emotion that springs from the ways in which what we see evokes in our own body and how that body there, or even that thin line there, engages our bodily responses and the emotions that follow directly from them. Thank you.